um, shortly. Um, but before that, um, we have um, something even more exciting than <laughs> advertised in the, uh, in the in the in the literature. Um, so, you're, is, there, is anyone here for a talk about seals? Okay, so you're, you're not going to get a talk about seals, you're going to get something f phenomenally more exciting. Um, there's going to there's be, they, they say that the, the, uh, the basis of every great story is conflict, and what we're going to be hearing about from, um, from Dr. Sarah Lane today um, is uh, the story of the fighting life of sea anemones. So Sarah um, did her uh, PhD, sorry, she did her undergraduate degree, master's degree and PhD at the University of Exeter down the Falmouth campus um, and then moved to do postdoctoral work um, on um, f fighting sea anemones and um, hermit crabs um, at the University of Plymouth. Um, and since uh, very recently, this year, um, Plymouth University made an excellent choice in, um, in, in, in offering uh, Sarah a lectureship. Um, and so she's beginning her own independent research um, at, Pl at Plymouth, which is a really exciting time for anyone. So welcome, Sarah, um, and the, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, George. Sure. Um, thank you for coming. Um, I hope that, um, I hope that those of you who are going to see you talk about seals this interesting, maybe more interesting than it would have been if it was about seals. Um, so, I wanted to start with this slide. Um, I could have, and I did originally have a picture of two sea anemones having a fight on this slide, but I thought that was too much of an early reveal. And first of all, <laughs> obviously the clues in the title, but I wanted you to first of all look at this seemingly very boring creature, which essentially looks like a blob of jelly, I think we could say, I'm not sure. Um, and the aim of my talk today is to convince you guys that this is not just a blob of jelly, but it's actually a fighting machine. Um, and moreover, is a really excellent species, or, or actually taxa, for us to learn more about fighting behaviour in animals. So, so this is the picture I had then. This is probably, if you've been to the shore at low tide, how you would have seen a sea anemone looking. Not very exciting. You possibly didn't even notice it because it was so dull. Um, but once the tide comes in, these uh, feeding tentacles appear uh, and it starts to look more like a sea anemone that you hopefully uh, know that I'm going to talk to you about today. Um, so this species here is the bee blip sea anemone which is what I have done my research on, and it's also the most common sea anemone that we find in the coasts here. Um, so you will hopefully likely have seen this in, in the rock pools, if not, if you go and have a look at the rock pools, then you can see it down there. So, first of all, I thought I'd give you an overview of, of what actually are sea anemones, because some of you may know what they are, some of you may not. Um, and first of all, I want to point out they are actually animals. So despite the fact that they're very, um, they're very sessile, so they don't move a lot, um, and they also, as I showed, don't often look very exciting when they're out of the water, they are animals. Um, and specifically, they're nadarians. So they're within the same family as jellyfish and corals. Um, nadaria coming from the Greek word, uh, which means stinging nettles. Um, and the reason they're within this family called nadaria is because all three of these um, groups use stinging tentacles to catch their prey. So you'll all probably be aware of jellyfish having stinging tentacles because humans are through these, uh, these stinging tentacles. But anemones also have stinging tentacles. So these long uh, pink tentacles you can see all around the body of this sea anemone are feeding tentacles that are full of stinging cells. And anemones use these in order to catch prey as it comes past in the water column. Um, there are at least 17 species of sea anemones in the UK alone. Um, so these are just some of the most common ones that we find uh, on our shores here. So that's the bee that I was telling you about. We also have these incredible snake lots of enemies, which um, have a mutualistic relationship with algae, which is why their tentacles are green. Um, we also have strawberry enemies, which look, as it says in the tin, like strawberries, um, and some really fascinating ones that live a little bit lower down on our shores. But you can see already that anemones are a huge plethora of colours and forms and shapes. Um, they're also relatively simple creatures uh, morphologically. 
So, as the title says, they have no brain, eyes, heart, gills, or even a bum. So, what they do have is they have an oral disc, and that's used both for ex uh, eating and for excreting. So, basically, doubles as a mouth and a bum. Um, they have the feeding tentacles, as I told you already, so it's really around here. Um, and they have a pedal disc, pedal meaning foot. Um, so, this allows them to stick to rocks without getting pushed away by the tide. So, in comparison to a lot of other animals, they're very morphologically simple. Um, and as I mentioned with those British species, anemones come in this huge array of beautiful colours and shapes and forms. So this is just a range of anemones that we see. Uh, this one seems to think it's a zebra, which is, and that's, that's not photoshopped, so this is a real creature. Mm -hmm. um, and they also provide uh, lots of services for other animals, so for instance, uh, providing homes for fish. Um, and generally throughout history, and it's easy to see why, anemones have been thought of as graceful, elegant, beautiful flowers of the sea. Um, so you might be already thinking, then why on earth are you supposed to be fighting in these graceful, elegant creatures? So this is now what I'm going to convince you of. So, oh, I don't know how to make this. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I should maybe press again. Do I press this button? I might have to come out of this and. Uh... Sorry, apologies. This was the big reveal, wasn't it? This is the suspense, isn't it? Or maybe it's a little bit of suspense, I don't know. Right, I've got it here. Yeah, it's a little bit of suspense, isn't it? Or maybe it's a little bit of suspense, I don't know. Right, I've got it here. I, I can see it um, working yes. here. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, but that's not. I'm not in slideshow here. That's the, that's the point. <laughs> Let me come out of that. <clears throat> Some of them can, yeah. So generally, then, I mean, so if you've ever, if you ever as a kid or as an adult put your finger in a sea anemone when you found it, you might feel a little bit of a, yeah. it feels like there's a sucking, but sometimes that is the, the nematocysts kind of, uh, sorry, stinging cells kind of uh, getting you a little bit, but generally it doesn't hurt. And yeah. um, things like the snake locks an enemy, so that one with the big green tentacles, yeah. they can sometimes actually hurt. So again, not as badly as a jellyfish by any stretch of the imagination, but I would recommend not touching those ones, just in case. Um, but yeah, generally the uh, stinging cells that they have don't, aren't very effective on humans. Um, I have touched a snake box and been stung slightly by it, yeah, and it, it was nothing, you know, just a, oh, I won't be doing that again, but not, not anything. More like a little kind of static shock, I guess, rather than anything. Uh, but the bee bits that I work with, they don't have any sting at all, no. I'd have them touch those, I'd not be worried. Are they most common? Yes, bee bits are the most common, yeah. Um, I think snake locks are relatively common as well, but they're usually found lower down the shore. Um, so most of the species we have in the UK are found in this kind of intertidal zone on the rocky shore, so where the tide comes in and out. Um, and, but snake locks can't retract their tentacles. So that means that they can't be out of the water when the tide goes out, so you find them a lot lower down because they have to stay within the water. Um, and then some of the other anemones along the bottom there, the day the duck, dahlia anemone, the gem anemone, and the cloak anemone, you don't really find those unless you're really low down on the shore. What's the biggest thing that they can catch? Um, good question. I have seen an anemone with a crab leg in its mouth. Uh, which was quite big <laughs> compared to the little anemone. Um, I've also been sent pictures of them with fish in their, in their mouth, but that was a bigger species of an enemy. Um, but generally, it would just be you know whatever floats along in the in the, uh, in the column. I don't know whether they would actually have to digest those when they catch them. Um, but yeah, any kind of detritus really that comes along, um, probably things like shrimp and things like that, they would be able to eat. 
suggest it, you suggest the juice is coming in, they can't chew. Yeah, no, 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 no chewing methods. So basically, inside them, so they have the, the mouth at the top, as it were, and then they just have a, a kind of um, gastric cavity, so just a hole in the middle of their body, and that's where they would digest, so that's where they'd have these kind of digestive juices, but they don't have any teeth or anything like that to be able to actually crunch anything down. Whereabouts in, in the UK or in the southwest would you recommend them for good beaches? Good beaches to look. Um, so, uh, Port Wrinkle in Cornwall is very good for beavlets in particular, they are everywhere, uh, and also for strawberry anemones. Um, Wembury is nice as well, and honestly, even just anywhere that there's a lot of shore really around, you know, they're, they're, once you get your eye on, especially the, the beavlets. So, I can say for sure that then that in Sipmouth here we, we can see beetlet and enemies, uh, and enemies and also the snake flops <coughs> ones as well. Yeah. So, you can you get them both here. Yeah. There's no chip rocks. Sorry? Chip rocks. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, but my, my, uh, I've taken my, take my son down, <laughs> down there looking for them. So, I um, I've got there, sort of, vaguely. Oh, right. So. Oh, there we go. Well, that's as bad as it So, that is a very sped up version of an enemy bite. So, that's sped up by about 12 times, I think. But hopefully, that gives you an idea of. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I, think it may, I think it may come out big with a bit of luck. Yeah, there we go. There we go. <laughs> Right hand side. The right hand side of the bar. There. No. Too far. Yeah, the right hand side. Which volume? If you just drag it back, she doesn't just drag it back. I'll try. Well, as long as everybody got an idea of the fact that they're having a fight, that's the main thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it doesn't. Okay. okay. Well, essentially, we're going to go through this fight in some more detail in a minute, but the main thing I want you to know is that was quite a vicious attack from this guy on the left-hand side here. He has just inflated himself and has scraped his, uh, these, this part of his body that I'm going to introduce you to in a minute all the way down that home there, okay? Has he got muscle to enable him to move? Um, that's a good question. So, they mostly... So they do have muscle around their body column, so around the edge of their body, but they also um, they intake water and express water out in order to move a lot of the time. So most of it is based on this kind of so using the water reaction. Yeah, exactly. Right, I'm just gonna. I'm gonna yeah, go sorry about that. That's okay. Um, that you know, plastic water body. Okay, so the main point is. In history, they've generally been thought of as these beautiful, very peaceful, tranquil, you know, um, flowers of the sea that don't do a lot, but they do they fight. Um, so you might wonder, well, why on earth do these dogs fight? Um, and as I mentioned just now, when we were talking about the anemones in the UK, most of the species we find are um, in this intertidal zone here. Um, and this means that when the, uh, when the tide goes out, those anemones are then exposed to the air, so they're not in water anymore, and they're also exposed to uh, predators. So during this time when they're out of the sea, they want to be able to have the best spot on the shore um, in order to protect them from drying out and from being eaten. Um, so this is what these anemones, in particular these beaver anemones, are fighting over. They're fighting over their territory. Um, and it's not just in anemones, so fighting is a really important uh, behaviour that we see across the majority of the animal kingdom. And the reason for that, again, is because it settles disputes over things such as territory, mix, and food. 
So all the way from these tiny microscopic nematodes that strangle each other, all the way up to humans, um, you know, who fight for fun and also uh, for, for war, for being a territory. Um, so fighting is a really important behaviour. But why would I study it in anemones rather than in, say, these stags or these elephant seals or even perhaps in humans? Um, and there are lots of different reasons, uh, one of which, of course, is that it's much easier to have anemones in the lab than it is to have stags or elephant seals in the lab. Um, but there are lots of other cool reasons that make anemones specifically a very interesting uh, organism to be fighting. So the first and perhaps most important reason is that anemones have secret weapons. So despite the fact that, as I showed you earlier, they're relatively morphologically simple creatures, what they do have mm. is weapons. So this again is a bee that anemone, and it's named for these blue bee-like structures called aquahagy. Um, and these are weapons that are full of stinging cells. Um, and unlike the stinging cells found in the feeding tentacles, in these red tentacles, the purpose of the stinging cells in these aquapagi is purely to attack other anemones. So they have evolved specifically as weapons to fight other anemones with. Um, and that's because anemones are immune <coughs> to the stinging cells in these feeding tentacles. Those feeding tentacles only work to sting prey, they don't work to, to sting each other. So fighting is so important for these enemies that they've actually evolved specific weapons in order to win fights and secure their territory. So, in that video that you may or may not have seen, depending on if you looked in time, um, what we were seeing was that this enemy on the left hand side uh, had, had inflated up its body column, so by taking it in the water and pushing itself up, it then inflated these aquapages of these weapons, now look a little bit like blue sweet corner or something. Um, it will then do what we call overtopping, which is essentially where it falls over the top of its opponent, um, and it will then scrape those aquapages, those weapons, down the body of its opponent. Um, and why it does this is because these aquapages, these weapons, are, as I said, full of stinging cells called nematocytes. Um, and these nematocysts are very similar to harpoons. So essentially, how they look, um, the, they are when they're inside the aquapagi, so before they've been released, they're all coiled up. Uh, as soon as they touch the other anemone, uh, the coil releases, um, and they are basically sprung out of the aquapagi into the opponent, where they stick uh, by these barbs. Um, and this process, so from the onset of these nematocysts being released, is actually one of the fastest biological processes in the animal kingdom. So it's very instantaneous. I think it was in the, in the 70s, some scientists did some experiments where they, they looked at what would actually make these uh, nematocysts uh, released from the apocagy. So basically they had um, an enemy's apocagy and they touched it onto different things, and for a, sh a shrimp, a crab, other creatures and they found that the only thing that caused these um, nematocysts to be released was when that aquapagia was touched against um, an, an, another anemone of the same species. So they are very, very specific um, in their use. So when a, an attacker, so that attacker that we saw on the left hand side, scrapes the aquapagia down the side of its opponent, uh, it leaves behind these injuries. Um, and we call these aquahagal peels, but we can just call them injuries or peels for today. Um, and essentially, these are pieces of the attacker's aquahagy that are then also full of these nematocysts. So when they attack, they don't just get one of these stinging cells fired, they actually get thousands of them uh, just within a single injury alone. Um, and what these, um, what these injuries do is they actually cause localised cell death. Um, on that payment, and that will linger long after the fight is over. So it's actually quite a, quite a severe injury. Um, and one of the really nice things about anemones in terms of looking at fighting is that we can actually measure the extent of injury that they incur. And if you think about the different types of injuries um, that animals get from fighting, there's not actually many that are easily, um, easily measurable in a, in a kind of quantifiable, um, quantifiable way. So, for instance, if you have 
a wound on an animal, you might be able to measure the size of that wound as a kind of idea of severity, um, but you couldn't necessarily um, quantify it in any other sense. So in the anemones, what we can do is we can literally just count the number of these peels that are left behind to give us an idea of the extent or severity of the injury that's then comparable to other enemies who have also been in trials. Um, and being able to do this also means that we can measure the cost of those injuries, and we can measure the cost of the different um, severities of injury as well. Um, the way we can do this in anemones is really kind of gross, but also interesting, because we can use their mucus. So this anemone I showed you at the beginning is very shiny, and that's not because that anemone is wet. That anemone is out of water and dry. But anemones have a mucus coating uh, that they use as a protective barrier um, when they're out of water. Um, and so basically this protective barrier stops them from drying out. Um, and it's also uh, chock full of antimicrobial, antibacterial properties which help it to protect itself against any kind of bacterial infection. Um, and this is of interest to uh, biomedical researchers uh, because the compounds that you find in here possibly have applications for making um, other antibacterial uh, medicines, so antibiotics and things like that. But it's also useful to me as a researcher um, because I can use that mucus to look at this anemone's capability for mounting an immune response after it's been injured in a fight. So we can look at the ability to, um, to battle bacterial infections as um, a kind of proxy of the cost of those injuries that it's incurred. So if you think about it, when you're, uh, when you're injured, you're less likely to be able to fight infection. And that's exactly what I was looking at these anemones. Um, so this mucus provides a really easy way to look at this, um, and actually a, um, a, a way of doing it without really bothering the anemone at all. So all we have to do is leave the anemone out of water for about half an hour, and it will start to produce a lot of this mucus because it's out of the water. We can then collect that mucus, and we can inject it into a petri dish that has been um, coated in a, in a bacteria. We can then measure the amount of bacteria that, that the compounds within this mucus are able to eat or able to destroy. So the amount of bacteria that gets killed gives us an idea of the ability of this anemone to mount an immune response to an infection. Um, and we did this both before a fight and then twice after. Um, and what we see is that anemones that have um, incurred these injuries, these peels, actually have a reduced capacity to, um, to fight bacterial infection for at least 24 hours after the fight. And you can see that actually at 24 hours, their ability is still decreasing. So they're not getting back up to their normal pre-fight level that's seen in this dark bar here. Um, so anemones provide a really cool system for us to look at both injury in general, the, to be able to quantify that injury, and then to look at the cost of injury. Um, and understanding the costs of fighting is really important for understanding the evolution of fighting in general. So, uh, animals have to make decisions about fights based on the relative costs and benefits involved. So we've already kind of discussed some of these benefits earlier. So the reason that animals fight is to be able to gain access to the territory, so they be classed as the benefit of fighting. But then you also have costs of fighting, including the energetics, as Pamela is very tired, um, but also now injury as well. Um, and if we can understand exactly how costly injury is, we can start to make predictions about uh, when an animal should choose to continue in a fight and when an animal should choose to give up. Something else that's really interesting about these guys um, is that attackers don't get away on scale. So as I mentioned earlier, these injuries are actually pieces of the attacker's application of their weapons that have ripped off and stuck onto the opponent. Now what this means is that in order to inflict an attack, this anemone here has to actually rip pieces of its body off of itself. So attackers end up with these holes in their apraheji, which we can see here. Um, and they, because of the way that the attacks work in this system, they physically cannot attack their opponents without damaging themselves. Um, and this is something that we've termed self-inflicted damage. And it's something that before we noticed it in these anemones, in these tiny little blobs of 
jelly, we had never thought about um, in, in terms of animal context before. Um, but when we think about it in terms of humans, it's actually quite obvious. So this is Muhammad Ali and George Foreman in their famous Rumble in the Jungle fight. And the reason that these two world class boxers are wearing gloves is because if Muhammad Ali threw that punch without wearing one, he would likely break his hand. Um, this is an injury that's specifically called boxer's fracture for that very reason. Um, and this boxer's fracture is an example of self-inflicted damage. So by throwing an attack, Muhammad Ali not only injures George Foreman, but also injures himself, unless he's wearing those gloves. Um, and that's exactly what we're seeing in the anemones. Um, and the more we started to look around at different animals and different literature, we actually found that this self-inflicted damage is more common uh, than we thought. So for instance, in beetles uh, and in stags, they can often lose um, either an entire antler or part of a horn. Um, and this self-inflicted damage has different consequences for these guys. So in the stag, that means that for the rest of that mating season, he won't be able to fight for access to females. But in the next season, he'll regrow that, uh, that antler and be able to fight again. Whereas for these stag beetles, um, or the rhinoceros beetle, sorry, they will never be able to regrow that horn, so they only grow it once when they become adults. So that suggests that actually the self inflicted damage can have different costs uh, depending on the animal. Um, and this is again important for helping us to understand how animals make decisions in fights, because now if we add in an additional cost of self inflicted damage, that may actually then tilt the scales to make the cost of fighting for these anemones uh, and for these other species outweigh the possible benefits to be gained from that fight. Um, okay, so the other very interesting thing about anemones makes them good for, uh, for research and fighting is that they can actually produce clones of themselves, so genetically identical clones. Um, so an, an, a sea anemones in general can uh, reproduce both sexually and asexually, but being able to reproduce asexually means they don't necessarily need a mate. So anemones can do this in a few different ways. The main ways, uh, so this is a process called budding, uh, whereby the anemones break off little pieces of tissue themselves, um, and then that tissue will form into a fully fully formed baby anemone. Um, and these, all of these babies here, there's that four or five there I can see. So they are all clones of the big mother anemone that, that they're sitting on. Um, a different way that anemones reproduce asexually is actually just by splitting their bodies in half. Um, so this is a process called fission. Um, not all anemones uh, will do either of these, but so anemones generally either do one or the other. Um, there's also some other processes they use, but this is just to give you two examples. But the main point is that this means that anemones actually uh, produce offspring that are genetically identical to themselves. So unlike you and I, if we have children, those children are only 50% related to us. These so the anemones are 100% related to their parents, 100% identical genetically. Mm. And what this means is that it allows us to separate the effects mm. of genes from the effects of the environment on aggressive behaviour. So the way that we can then do that is if we have three different uh, genotypes or clone lines of anemones, so these red guys here are all genetically identical to each other, and these blue guys are all genetically identical, and so on, we can then take one of these clones and put them in different environmental conditions and look at the effect that their genes and the environment they grow up in or experience has on the likelihood of them becoming very aggressive and, and exhibiting aggressive behaviour. And because these anemones produce uh, lots of babies, we can then actually have lots of individuals of the same uh, genotype within each of these environments, meaning that we can make a scientifically robust study. Um, and the ability to separate genes and environment uh, when looking at aggression is really important. So if we think of things like dogs, for instance, so there's a lot of uh, trouble with aggression in dogs, um, and oftentimes that's blamed on the breed, which has a lot to do with their genetics. Um, but we can't really separate the, the kind of genetics from the environment in dogs. 
But things like anemones give us an, a brilliant um, system in which to be able to do that because we can control for the genetics and we can control the environment. And there's also some really incredible um, behaviours that we see within, uh, within these kind of clones or uh, clonal groups of anemones. So the fights that I've been talking about so far have been uh, kind of two anemones, Halia Tiff, and then going on the day. But this is actually a species of anemone called the aggregating anemone. We don't get them here, unfortunately. They're off the coast of California. Um, but these anemones form these huge uh, colonies. So here in this picture, there's a big colony there, and then there's also a big colony here. And those colonies, so this colony here, is one genotype, so they are all genetically identical to each other. And this colony here is a different genotype. So with different, they, they are all genetically identical to each other, but the two of them are different. Um, and essentially what they do is these two colonies fight each other over the space that they have uh, on the shore. Um, and you can actually see down here and more in this picture that what they have between them is a kind of no man's land. So they literally keep this no man's land between the colonies um, and they send out these poor little anemones here which are known as scant enemies, and their job is to go out into this no man's land and see who's about, and see whether there are any incoming threats from the other colony, and to report back. So they'll often come back looking a bit battered, like this one does, who's actually covered in those appeals, those injuries. Um, so this species has kind of casts, so similar to bees. So it doesn't have workers per se, but what it does have is it has these, um, these warrior anemones here. So they have far more of those weapons because they attack crazy than any of the others, and their job is purely to attack. They have, as I said, these, these scout anemones that go out and check out what's going on and report back. And then within the middle of the colony, they have anemones that don't have any weapons at all, but have a lot of, um, have a lot of gonads, and their job is purely to reproduce. So they have these reproductive cars, these scouts, and these uh, warrior anemones. Um, so that's pretty amazing behaviour for this, this, this um, pretty complex behaviour as well, for this kind of blob of jelly that we started with. So I hope that I've convinced you that we can actually learn quite a lot about fighting from this seemingly sedate uh, blob of jelly on the shore. And perhaps now next time you go out to the shore and you see these guys, you'll give them a bit more credit. Um, thank you very much. If you have a question.